Welcome back, everyone. Are you all with me? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great, okay. So, we, this session will last for the next 40 minutes. So, we will close exactly at 2 o'clock, which will save a little bit of time for other equally important sessions. So, everyone is sacrificing a little bit of their time so that all the speakers can take appropriate time to cover the topics, very important topics they wanted to cover. And, and thanks to the fantastic cooperation from my previous speakers who have set the bar high, and I believe we are going to repeat the same thing for the speakers who will be coming in next. So just to recap what happened before we went for lunch, you know, you listen to various sessions and various speakers, and especially for this particular session, you listen to very important two voices painting the bigger picture or government's perspectives on child protection and education in the Romanian context. So we have another four more speakers. Just to repeat what I said before we went for break, you know, those who missed the headlines. The next two speakers are going to speak about what is actually happening on the ground. It's a reality check, what is happening and the whole idea of painting the idea of continuous improvement when we all move forward. And towards the end, we'll come to two speakers. One will be a video, and the other, we have the speaker in the room uh, who will give perspectives about global and international experiences as well as standards. So if you all are with me, I would like to invite my next speaker, that is Paula Bulancha. Uh, Paula has worked with the UNICEF for over 18 years in various positions at the country and regional levels, developing strategic partnerships, particularly with governments, and formulating national policies. Every crisis is a, is a new beginning when it comes to formulating new policies. And you'll be listening to Paula in a minute. Currently, Paula is actually based in Baghdad, but being from Romania, when the crisis started, Paula has been deployed to Romania, and Paula has been in Romania for the last more than three months. Paula, over to you, and the rules of the game has not changed at all. You get a signal at three minutes, and you get four minutes. All right, great. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, bună ziua. <laughs> Um, ca și predecesarea mea, uh, Monica, um, eu uh, sunt româncă, e o plăcere să fiu înapoi în țară, voi vorbi însă în limba engleză, uh, uh, considerând faptul că uh, și alți membri din panel sunt uh, reprezintă organizații internaționale. Once again, after, good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for the invite. Um, it's such an honor to be here um, to speak on behalf of UNICEF, but also on behalf of a wider group of organizations that are coming together under the um, Child Protection work, Subworking Group and an Education Subworking Group, part of the coordination, the broader co coordination between UNICEF and the government of Romania. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about what works and what are the challenges. <laughs> and looking at the at different frameworks, global and national frameworks that we have, I try to group the what works, um, the good examples, the good practices that are happening actually right now in Romania, um, and, and use the, the current examples to, to encourage colleagues to keep going and, and do more of what already they are doing and that it's working. So one of them is that the main principle for the Romania response was that we actually build on existing systems. We don't start from scratch. We don't repeat the mistakes that we've done in, in Syria crisis or Yemen crisis or other crises in the world. Um, so um, the fact that um, national actors, in particular the government, are working together to bridge the divide between the humanitarian response and development work, um, and, and the fact that the national action plan actually provides concrete suggestions of actions um, that various actors, especially government, um, can take to um, to take forward, can implement to take forward um, and to ensure better integration of refugee children in national. Um, child protection and education systems, but also this um, allows for better harmonization between the child protection and education procedures that are normally set in humanitarian um, settings 
uh, with the so-called regular ones that we have, um, part of our regular national procedures on child protection and education. So using the system strengthening approach to address the needs of all children, um, children will uh, avoid duplication of services and support better integration of refugee children. Now, just a very punctual couple of examples. One of them that it's highlighted in all the global frameworks is ensuring the national legal framework are inclusive of refugee children and that um, authorities are tapping into national development plans when they respond. And I think this is very nicely happening. Both the National Child Protection Authority and the Ministry of Education have been leading the national um, the discussions in their respective areas um, when they developed the, the national response plan. Um, and the fact that they've been very inclusive and they looked at existing frameworks and the fact that, for example, the Ministry of Education already had a policy on the integration of refugee children even be before the Ukrainian um, crisis happened, it's a good practice and a good example and we'd like to see that continuing. Um, Simil so, um, as I mentioned, uh, the two um, national counterparts have been um, in the lead for drafting the um, respective components of the National Action Plan, and, and we look forward to receiving or to seeing um, how best we can operationalize um, this one and, and to ensure that the integration policies um, are um, adopted and implemented. Um, <clears throat> the second one is um, uh, that it's stated in many frameworks is that we need to consider the needs of refugee communities and, and in child protection and education systems. So again, several organizations, um, I have to say mainly um, national and international organizations conducted um, needs assessments. Some of them more comprehensive than others. Some of them much more specific on, on, on thematic areas. Um, but the fact that the national authorities are looking at business assessments and, and trying to shape the response according to the results of those um, assessments is extremely critical. Also from our side, and, and uh, in particular um, UNICEF and um, UNFCR, we look at accountability for affected populations. Probably this is a terminology that is rather new in Romania, but um, it's, it's um, really highly on our agenda. And basically what, what um, implies is that we give space and voice to um, refugee refugee communities, but refugee children in our case, um, to express you know, their needs and to make sure that their feedback is again incorporated into um, humanitarian actions and on a longer term into the development work that, um, you know, in the integration programs. Um, the third, obviously, the third uh, component is providing quality services. So I think it's very, yeah. <laughs> It's very, it's the last one. It's the very, it's very important to make sure that we provide services. And I know that um, several organizations already responded um, immediately, obviously, but also on a shorter and longer term. And you'll hear from Stefan and other colleagues uh, giving you very concrete examples on how this is happening. But um, the point I want to make here is uh, the need of having comprehensive services because it's it's a huge link and, and you know if we don't do right inter protection it will have implications on education and you'll have implication on health and so on so just I, I would like to highlight this need of having a holistic approach and making sure that each sectors are talking to each other last in terms of challenges I'm just listing them you heard um, some of them already mentioned um, data the fact that we don't have enough data definitely not disaggregated data um, um, Christina mentioned that we are, we are working together on setting up a system, that's fantastic, but we still need to do more. Um, ensuring that child protection and education workforce is capacitated, and that means um, the Romanian workforce, but also tapping into the resources that we have from the Ukrainian side. And um, in, in terms of services, one of the areas that is constantly lacking, but yet very much needed, is the mental health and psychosocial support, which I think, again, links to both child protection and education. I know it was very fast, but thank you so much. I think we are getting a better feel of what is actually happening on the ground. And I have one more speaker. It's Stefan Leonsko, and he's a legal counselor and project coordinator for the Jesuit Refugee Service. As you know, Jesuit Refugee Service mission is to accompany, serve, and to advocate on behalf of refugees, and in this context, specifically refugee children. Stefan, over to you. I think I'll start the presentation in English, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, 
we try to put things in the context, and for the Romanian context, uh, there are two major points to be uh, mentioned. One is that Romania is still a transit country, and uh, as uh, we heard, more than 90% of the Ukrainians have crossed the country and they did not stay in. And that was one of the challenges that we had to face. And the second one is that we had separated families. We had 90% of Ukrainians in the country being children and, and women. Therefore, we had to, to adjust our uh, you know, needs assessment and data collection. And we said that uh, this can be done mainly through the communities and not necessarily to uh, you no know, official data that uh, could be obtained. And this was related to the fact that uh, in most of the cases, the residence was not known from the very beginning and there were so many changes. They moved from one, uh, one city to another. The second point is on education. It turned to be that education and the facilities provided for education were safe areas for children. Uh, some of the teachers that are in this room and they are Ukrainians, they told us that children felt more comfortable being in a school, in a space looking like a school as they had in Ukraine. Some of them were not aware of the fact that there were conflict, there's a conflict in Ukraine. Some of them were not told the truth at the beginning. So this education tend to be uh, different uh, as a different approach. The second thing is that education is supporting integration. If children will be in school, children will be, you know, involved in different activities throughout the day, then parents, don't forget women mainly, may be able to work as part of the integration program. Uh, so education is also related to this part of integration. And here we had, uh, you know, uh, the recommendation that we made to, to the authorities that we should use mainly formal uh, facilities, formal schools, in order to provide education and not to improvise and find, you know, uh, warehouses or other uh, facilities. And the other thing is that, uh, as uh, Paula mentioned before, we should have uh, decided a comprehensive, also an integrated response. And this should take into account not only children in education, but also uh, the rest of the family. Uh, and at the same time, educators. Let's not forget them because they are also part of these discussions. Challenges that we face, uh, should we have different classes or should we have uh, some children going to Romanian classes? Uh, that will be a challenge for, uh, for this fall. Uh, recognition of qualification for teachers is still one of the issues on the strategy, uh, governmental strategy agenda, and we hope that this will be solved somehow. And also, um, we also have to take into account the fact that most of the children will prefer and their parents we prefer to continue education in Ukrainian education system. So even though that we plan to integrate them in the national uh, uh, Romanian system, most probably this autumn will have some, most of them going with the Ukrainian system. So we have to find the transition for this part. And it's a challenge because of the fact that even now we are in contact with a few thousand children that are enrolled in this kind of uh, education uh, system in schools, while we have more than 30,000 children, as, as mentioned before, in Romania. Uh, translation would be also important in order to ensure communication. This, will be done, this needs to be done in schools, and we have to, to think of you know, options on, in this regard. And we're also uh, thinking of mapping identified children. I'm still looking on the fact that uh, there are so many children that are not in contact with Romanian schools, that are not in contact with the Ukrainian uh, schools established in Romania, and they are somehow uh, outside any system. We know that, uh, or we are told that they will continue education in, uh, you know, online, uh, but in education is not done online. They should be in contact with us and with the authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. And one of the reasons why we are requesting the speakers to stick with four minutes is because we would like to create an opportunity for questions coming from you. And some of the speakers can pick up some of your questions and give answers or give a perspective. So we have two more speakers, and the next one will be a video. But before we play that, those who are joining online, please post your questions. Uh, I have two colleagues in the room. You know, one is Anita sitting somewhere here, and I can also see. Alison, this side, they both will be picking up 
questions that are coming into the chat box and they will be relaying that questions into this room which will go to some of the speakers and also we will be taking questions from this room so we've got two more speakers and the next one is Hani. Hani Mansurian is a senior child protection advisor with UNICEF. Today he is joining as the coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. The Alliance is a global interagency child protection group and they set technical standards and provide technical support to protect children from violence, conflicts and war, as well as protect them from exploitation in humanitarian crisis settings. Hani is based in Kenya and is joining us now from Kenya either live or through a short video. protection and humanitarian action. Firstly, I wanted to apologize for not being there physically with you guys and really appreciate uh, the government of Romania and Plan International for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to participate remotely. Um, and also kudos to, um, to the government of Romania to be paying attention to such an important topic uh, amidst all the work that they're doing to support Ukrainian children. Um, I would like to highlight uh, an aspect that keeps coming back to us as a, as a point of departure uh, throughout our many years of collaboration with the education sector uh, through our, our initiative, joint initiative with uh, the Interagency Network for Education Emergencies, INE, um, and that's the issue of child well-being and health development. Um, if you really think about uh, even the rights of children, the, the right to education or the right to protection that are enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the ultimate goal of, of all of that and all of the work that we do is to make sure that a child is well and that they can develop in a healthy way so they can live their full potential. Um, and if you really look at that as our, uh, as our point of departure for both child protection and, and education sectors, because that's ultimately what we both want to achieve, um, then it becomes much easier to conceptualize this collaboration across the, uh, the two sectors. Um, and it also starts um, help us realize that it actually doesn't make sense if, if we don't collaborate with each other, if we think about our, our areas of work as silos, because a child that is not doing well uh, at home, they're subject to violence, they're separated from their parents, they're forced to marry at a young age, they're not gonna do well in school. Um, and at the same time, we know from uh, a lot of research um, that exists that uh, children that don't have access to quality education are much more likely to be subject to a lot of negative child protection outcomes, including child marriage and, and other things. So these two really work hand in hand, in hand to keep um, children well and, and, and allow them to develop in a healthy way. Now, all of that for us is really placed in what we call the social ecology of a child, uh, which is based on the socio-ecological model. Um, and that's what this diagram, many of you probably have seen this before or something similar to this, that puts the child really at the center of, of, a, of its environment. And that's the family, community, society, and the socio-cultural norms. And us within child protection work really um, systematically within this structure. Uh, and one of the advantages that we can bring to, to the work of education is strengthen that link, those linkages between 
what happens with the child in terms of their, their protection, in terms of their education, throughout this whole social ecology and, and bring in the family, bring in the community and society and work on sociocultural norms, uh, which is the work that, that child protection typically does. It, it works on family strengthening, it works uh, with communities to protect children. Uh, and ultimately all of that feeds back into the ability of a child uh, to learn better uh, and, and contribute to uh, learning outcomes in, within education. Um, I stop there and hand over to my colleague, uh, Dean Brooks, who is there in the room with you guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hani, Hani, if you are there online, thank you very much for doing this. So now we are going to our last but not least, the speaker, uh, Dean Brooks. Dean is the director of the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies. And this network is an open, so you're all open to join that. And it's a global network of members working together within the humanitarian and development space. And the network's work is founded on the fundamental basic idea that the fundamental right to education and Dean is based in New York. Dean, over to you. Thank you so much, Rooney and esteemed colleagues. It's, it's really an honor to be here in this beautiful building. And um, I just want to echo Hanny's comments. I mean, congratulations to the country of Romania for picking up this issue at this time. Um, I've worked in many contexts where we come back and we say, oh, we need to work with child protection. Oh, child protection, we need to work with education. And But today, you're actually um, picking this up at, a, at the right time, at this moment in response. I'd like to add um, a couple of points to what, Han <clears throat> to what Hanny has said and some very practical um, points that, I, that we both talked about before. And he is very sorry that he couldn't be here. Um, he stayed up late last night to make that video for you. Um, but just to mention that both the Alliance for Child Protection and the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies also hold global standards for the, for the whole world to pick up that really look at quality, quality of response. So you have the INE minimum standards for education, response and recovery, and you have the child protection minimum standards. And we're a part of an umbrella under the SPHERE standards called the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. And those standards are global and created by thousands of experts across the world representing governments, UN, NGOs, affected populations, to say what is it we need to think about when we are responding to both education and child protection. So I say that <clears throat> because I want you to go home after this and look at those and think about those. But I also say that because one thing we've also learned in our communities of practice is that countries can take these up and own them. And so both of our networks have contextualization processes to help you as a country, and we have many examples where countries have done this, where they take the minimum standards and they contextualize them and they become, and what I would love to see is the Romanian minimum standards for education. And I'm happy to help you and all of you um, to make that happen. So I can only speak for a couple minutes, so a couple a couple more things I want to say. Um, there's so much I want to say, so I'm trying to get it all out in, in a couple minutes. Um, one thing Hanny and I um, were also talking about was leaving you with a very practical list of, of points, and, and we can share the PowerPoint afterwards. But what are the principles that would really help you, and it's been helping us as two global networks, principles to effective collaboration? I'm going to go through these eight very quickly and then um, share a PowerPoint with you afterwards. The first principle is to be context specific, building on what we just talked about. The second is to address multiple levels of the socio-ecology. You saw the diagram. So look at those various levels of the socio-ecology. 
Third, use a holistic multi-sector response. You've been hearing throughout the day of the coordination mechanisms. Link up with those. Child protection coordination, meet with education coordination, meet with the WASH coordination, meet with the protection coordination, and try to make that a regular habit. Measure the outcomes. Measure the change at risk and protection levels. And use a strengths-based approach. I heard our colleague talking about that. Look for resilience. How can we build that up together? And facilitate community ownership. Incredible work happening here, JRS and many partners. So build on that and facilitate that ownership. Be child and youth-centered and inclusive. That's the topic today. And when we do that, we're going to bridge the development in humanitarian systems. My key message for you really today is INEE, the Alliance, was created for you. And as you said, Uni, all of you can join INE today. You just go to INEE.org, click join, you can become a member. This is your professional community of practice. You can help the rest of the world. INE is 18,000 members, and our members want to learn from Romania. You join, you become active, you share your great work, and other countries will have the chance to learn from you. So thank you, and I look forward uh, to the next time we can talk. Thank you, Dean. And once again, many thanks to all the speakers who actually stuck with the time. Thank you so much. So we have about 15 minutes for taking your questions, uh, both audience in this room as well as joining us online. When you speak, when you raise a question, if possible, please state your name. And if you're happy, say from where you are coming or what you do very briefly in less than a sentence and put your question straight. And if you would like your question, to be answered or addressed by any particular speaker, please feel free to state your name. Otherwise, I will randomly pick one of the speakers to pick up. So who would like to go first? I'll take a couple of questions from this room. Then we'll take a couple of questions from online participants. And we'll give a chance to the speakers. Then we'll come back and take more questions. Yeah, yes, please go ahead. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please come closer to the microphone. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Salome Ndemi. I work with World Vision International, Senior Advisor for Education in Emergencies. My question is specifically about uh, the reforms to reach uh, children or persons with disability. I'd like to know what are the current uh, social protection priorities that uh, partners like ourselves and others can help with in our response to the Ukrainian refugee crisis in Romania. Thank you. Responding the crisis in, with 1,000 people who are settled in Timisoara. I have a question for the Minister of Education. Are you considering about Romanian classes to start intensive Romanian classes as other European countries do, like every day, five, six hours every day, which will maybe achieve better results than the four or six hours that the Minister of Education does now with the other refugees from other countries? Okay. Uh, Alison, do you have any questions from online participants? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We can't hear you. From Mina Peltola from World Vision Online. She's asking if there are any plans to conduct a joint needs assessment for education, I think. Okay. So we have three questions. You know, starting one was a straightforward question to the Ministry of Education on uh, intensive Romanian language plus other classes. The second is a question I think which can be taken up both by UN agencies as well as you know, practitioners on the ongoing efforts and also your own proposals on reforms that are needed to 
take care of or to respond to the needs of children who are differently abled or disabled or children who have lost mobility. And, and there was a last question which was very specific, which may be applicable to all, the need for joint as well as continuous needs assessment. Um. Am să răspund în românește la întrebare referitoare la uh, numărul de ore de limbă română. Uh, programe intensive, da, este în lucru în metodologie nouă. Uh, așa cum a spus și domnul secretar de stat la începutul, uh, în deschiderea uh, conferinței, un program de șase săptămâni intensiv de învățare a limbii române pe perioada verii pentru copii. Uh, Deocamdată de adulți nu avem, pentru adulți nu avem nimic, <coughs> însă dincolo de asta, nu știu dacă eu mi-am exprimat punctul de vedere, nu știu că șase săptămâni sunt suficiente pentru a învăța limba română suficient de bine pentru a funcționa, a fi funcțional în școală, deci trebuie sprijinită această imersie inițială cu programe care să continue pe toată durata anului școlar, în măsura în care ei sunt integrați în sistem. Dar da, este o metodologie nouă pentru școli de vară, care are în vedere programe intensive de predare a limbii române, în măsura, și asta este o altă uh, dificultate, provocare cu care ne întâlnim, în măsura în care avem suficient personal calificat să predea limba română ca limbă străină. Pentru că nu avem nici această istoria a predării limbii române ca limbă străină. Deci trebuie să lucrăm inclusiv la dezvoltarea acelor competențe profesionale. <coughs> Regarding the um, care for, for children with disabilities, um, I, I respond now from the perspective of the Ministry of Education, of course. We um, have opened also sp the spaces, the places in, in a Uh, schools for children with disabilities and they receive the same level of, of uh, support that Romanian children do. Now I won't be hypocritical and say that uh, it, that system of support is perfect for the Romanian children because it's not. So there is a lot to do to facilitate inclusion of people with disabilities and special educational needs of all types, but um, they, they benefit from the same types of support that Romanian children do. Thank you. Stefan? Should I respond to the question to needs assessment or? Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, it's quite difficult to make assessments, but Uh, as I've told you, uh, we will insist that uh, we, need collect, we need to collect data from communities. And the needs assessment can be done not only, you know, from uh, the plane looking up and then say these are the needs. Uh, we also would like to consult communities. That, that's the, the, the major point for, for us as NGO. Um, as far from the authority side, we know that data is collected and we try to find out uh, as many uh, information as possible regarding uh, refugees, Ukrainians present in the country, also third country nationals, we haven't discussed about this issue. Uh, and uh, this data uh, is not, uh, you know, um, correctly gathered for the moment due to the fact that more than half of them have not been registered yet with the authorities. We don't know exactly the places where they are currently. On the other hand, uh, they are not so keen to be registered. And this will raise a, a, a big question on how to address the issue on its assessment. So basically, we will try to consult the authorities, we'll, uh, the, the communities, and we'll also try to, uh, the moment when they get, uh, receive financial assistance, there's another way of you know, contacting them. So far, 33,000 Ukrainians have been financially assisted by the Red Cross, the, the largest number of uh, Ukrainians assisted. And we may find out from the Red Cross some uh, inputs in this regard. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I think especially on the point of uh, responding to the needs of children who are differently abled or disabled or with disabilities. Uh, I would like to check whether Paula or Dean, based on your vast experience elsewhere, whether you could give some perspectives on that, starting with Paula. 
Um, thank you so much. I'm not so sure if I can add more. Um, what was said already in the morning, um, and I, I'm not sure if we have in the room somebody from the Ministry of Labor, <laughs> um, but as, as it was mentioned in the morning, all children, refugee children, are, at least in theory, benefiting of all the rights and the benefits that Romanian children will. So as long as they are registered and they benefit from the temporary protection measure. So there are some conditions, so to say, in order for um, refugees to access the system. Um, but to my knowledge, those who are registered will be able to access all sorts of benefits, including, you know, disability allowance for those with disabilities, um, child allowance for, obviously, for all children and so on. So, yeah. But that's, as I said, uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and okay. Stefan and then, sorry. No worries. <laughs> no, it's just a slide. Uh, that's a distance. Um, I have something to say about child allowance. Uh, so far, um, it cannot be provided uh, to um, refugee children, even though they, they got temporary protection in Romania. It's an administrative bureaucratic uh, thing that needs to be adjusted by a legislative piece of uh, um, uh, government decision or uh, uh, law. We have a law giving the access to child allowance, but so far, uh, children, uh, even though that they got temporary protection, they've been uh, recognized as such, cannot be assisted and they, are, they cannot get the child allowance. We're still struggling for that. And um, Madalina was, uh, is one of the key factors here. She's struggling for you know, obtaining uh, uh, an official position from the government and to, to see how this can be uh, solved at the end. Thank you, Stefan and Dean. Okay. Yes, um, just to say, I don't know the context of Romania in terms of disability inclusion, uh, but we do have at INEE um, a working group that is looking at disability inclusion, and they have created global resources um, to help guide and think through a response. Personally, I'm a former special education teacher. Um, I used to be um, a teacher of deaf children and deaf blind, so it's very important to me. And one thing uh, within INEE is we have a very active uh, group of members who are helping to drive this work forward. So if that's something you're interested in or really care about, like me, please, um, you know, connect with us and, and participate. But definitely right now you can download a number of resources, um, the Pocket Guide to Inclusive Education, a Pocket Guide to Disability Inclusion, um, and you can also write to our help desk if there's anything you're looking for, um, and we can try to find it for you. And how can people reach out to you? Is it through the INE website? Yeah, just go to INE.org. Once you join, you connect to all of that. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Actually, I think we we have actually cut short this session by 30 minutes. We originally had one hour 15 minutes. We are almost closing this in 45 minutes. So I hope you take the opportunity of coffee break or possibly even after that. And the contacts have already been left by speakers. So I hope you get an opportunity to connect with them. There was an original idea to give them one more minute, but recognizing you have much more important, equally important sessions coming up. I am unfortunately going to close the session in the next two minutes. We would still be within that time, but I hope the idea of conversation continues throughout the conference and even after that. So first of all, I want to thank each one of you in this room and those who are joining online, and, and most importantly, our speakers. I think what a great learning experience this has been. Would you agree with me? If so, let's give them one more round of applause. Uh, I also want to thank, as well as congratulate the government of Romania, especially the leadership of Madam Madelina Tursa. Then, as I said, the speakers and the audience in this room, as well as those who joined online. I also want to thank the media representatives who have been covering the conference and the support staff, including the IT who made that happen. It's one of the smoothest uh, 
I think, transitions I've seen in some of the conferences. So thank you very much for doing that, and my own colleagues from Plan International. Those who missed uh, the online session, you may want to check out some of the fantastic artwork and graphic that is being developed online as these sessions are going on. And I'm sure that Vikrant will announce towards the end of the day how people can uh, access it. So maybe while closing, I, I want to once again remind all of us, as we heard throughout the day, and I believe that we'll continue to hear, this crisis is far from being over. And this is not going to be a 100 meter sprint. And we heard very clearly the need and the necessity to make sure that no one is left behind, as well as no time to lose during this process. Uh, there is no break after this session, so you will continue to hear some of these things, plus more exciting things when the next sessions, session start in a few seconds. Perhaps the most important being why we exist as the sector and, and the whole idea of human values as well as humanitarian principles as a guiding force when we move forward. And finally, the power of compassion and the importance of collaboration to take this work forward. So once again, thank you very much for joining. And this session is closed. And I invite the next moderator to come and get the ball rolling once again. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Online. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, one more time. Very glad to see everybody back. Practically all seats are filled despite the, the delays in the, and the after lunch period. So thank you and welcome back. This session is co-moderated by myself. I'm Alison Joyner, Education and Emergencies Technical Lead for Plan International. Um, and I'd just like to highlight that that Education and Emergencies for Plan is part of what we describe as inclusive quality education. It has the same objective. It is working towards the same goals of quality education, whatever the context. Um, so I just wanted to give you that footnote um, as part of the basis for the starting point of this discussion. And uh, good afternoon again, bună ziua încă, și pare că s-a înserat. Um, numele meu este Radu Sechei, sunt consilier al Ministrului Educației și o să comodorez această uh, discuție. O să avem uh, trei prezentări inițial și apoi sper să fie mai mult timp pentru discuție și pentru întrebări și uh, să fim mai mai activ și în ceea ce privește comentariile, pentru că e important să auzim și punctul de vedere din partea dumneavoastră, dacă uh, aveți și cu siguranță aveți și sunt pertinente. Mulțumesc. So, I'm going to start off and introduce the presenters and then Radu will take over to moderate a discussion afterwards and we really would like to encourage as much participation as possible particularly from people online, as well as people in the room. So please gather your questions and your comments. We're very keen to hear from you. We have fewer presentations uh, with a view to leaving more time for discussion. We are a little bit behind, so this session will take one hour. We'll take a break, and then we will go into the second technical session um, with a view to finishing on time.
So just as a brief introduction to the three sessions, the panels, sorry, three presentations that we're going to hear now, we've heard a lot of very positive information about the very good work that's already being done, led by the government of Romania, and in collaboration with partners, national and international, and of course, fundamentally, relying on those teachers, psychologists, and many other people who have been supporting refugees coming from Ukraine. We've heard about policies, laws, plans, and most recently, on the last session, we, talk, we heard about minimum standards that exist at the global level. What we want to do in this session is to focus on two or three good examples of the practice, because we know, we all know, that the reality of living in any context is different from the ideal. And of course, unfortunately, that's more the case when you're living in a crisis context like this one. So we want to try to highlight a few examples where good practice has helped a situation that can be comparable to this that might help this. And fundamentally, we want to highlight the importance of listening to those people who are affected by the crisis, to the teachers, the learners themselves, their parents and families, and how we can try to respond. And so that just reinforces the fact that we're really keen then to leave time for some feedback from people here who are experiencing this crisis. So very briefly, the presenter, presenters will introduce themselves, um, but I'll just give you an overview of the session. So we'll start with a presentation from UNHCR, Monsieur ben Benoit Dansambourg, who is a senior education officer who will be giving examples from good practice um, relevant to the Romanian context from a UNHCR perspective outside of Romania. Secondly, we will have a presentation by Lisette Cardoso from Plan International. She's the Education and Emergency Specialist for the region of the Americas for Plan. And she will be talking about a training strategy for teachers in emergency contexts, which has been used in response to the Venezuelan migration crisis. Uh, in Southern America. And it's called Creando Aula, which means creating classroom. And then finally, we'll have a video presentation from Camila Lodi, who is the Global Psychosocial Support Head of Unit for NRC, for the Norwegian Refugee Council, talking about a specific response to children who are potentially traumatized called the Better Learning Program. And I hope in the room we have Alexia Latsu. Can you wave your hand if you're here, Alexia? Great. So Alexia is working for Norwegian Refu Council, Refugee Council based in Romania. So she will be here to help with questions, etc. afterwards. Thank you. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over first to Benoit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have actually one good and one bad news to share with you. I will start with the bad news. I'm not going to use the beautiful presentation I prepared for you, but you will find that presentation in the, the post-conference pack. And that presentation is basically a number of lessons learned and good pra practices we've learned in the, the education response for Syrian refugees in Turkey. So let me start by saying that our work in education is rooted in the global compact on refugees that was mentioned this morning by the FCDO representative. The global compact is an ambitious but still realistic call to enhance the inclusiveness of education systems so that national and refugee children and youth can sit side by side and learn together. Inclusion is not an on-off switch. And we do not have a magic wand to make it happen overnight. It's a process and it takes time. Let me just talk about a couple of considerations 
for meaningful inclusion. First of all, it's important to recognize that there are obstacles, that's clear, and challenges, that we agree. But there are also solutions. So this is a reason why it's so important to draw lessons from other contexts. Curriculum shift, you know, shifting from the home country to the host country. Curriculum is a challenge, it's clear. But again, here, let's look at solutions. Refugee teachers, for example, should be seen as an asset who can support the shift. Language of instruction, we've learned, we've heard a lot about language this morning. And, uh, and our UNICEF colleagues were saying that the summer will be short. Yes, indeed, but it will be a key moment to try to uh, promote uh, the learning of language. And I think it's important to realize here that children are so good at picking languages. You know, too often when we refer to children, we talk about vulnerabilities. I think it's important to remember that children are also resilient and, and ready to respond to the challenges they live in. Assistance to teachers. Um, here, again, you know, very often when we talk about trauma, we look at children, the students, the learners. Let's not forget that teachers may have gone through very traumatic experience. Hence, the need for mental health and psychosocial support for both learners and their teachers to enhance study skills, to improve well-being, and to bring hope to both learners and teachers. We will hear more on mental health and psychosocial support in the following presentations. What are the benefits of inclusion? Based on, on our experience, and not just based on the global compact on refugees, but on experience we've gathered and collected over the years, this is the best way of providing quality certified education. By having national and refugee children sitting side by side, in the same classroom, we are actually inclusion fosters cohesion. Inclusion will help reduce feelings of isolation and separation. Through inclusion, we use relief funds to strengthen national education systems rather than setting up parallel systems. Through inclusion, we provide quality learning opportunities. With the social dynamics of a classroom, rather than facing a laptop or a tablet the whole day. A couple of recommendations uh, based on, on our ex experience. The sooner we start, the, the better for the education response. Early action is essential, and both education and child protection um, sectors can play a key role to ensure the return of all children and youth to schools. We need to recognize that we are planning for uncertain futures and acknowledge the scope of displacement. We need to have a clear sense of how many refugees can be accommodated in schools in the immediate and medium term. We need to identify specific roles for and supportive actions that can be taken by NGOs. Example, supporting language classes during the summer holidays or organizing after-school programs. Communication is key. Communicate and listen to the needs and concerns of refugee teachers and host community parents. 
governments and refugee support agencies should provide parents with information on their educational options and provide the rationale for using this inclusion approach. As far as possible, we should not establish separate schools or classrooms for refugees. We need to find ways, including them in the normal functioning of the school and have mixed classes for activities that are less language dependent. Finally, I would like to, to stress that we could use the Ukrainian, all the, the uh, digital resources that the, the Ministry of Education in Ukraine has uh, developed to reinforce learning, and this could be used as a tool for remedial support, but shouldn't be considered an option for replacing integration into Romanian national school systems. It was very encouraging to hear today that many of those recommendations are already being implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benoit. And I think it's very encouraging to hear from the voice of experience about the fact that it is a long process, but already a great start has been made here in Romania. Um, and that we need to be rec recognize the length of time that things take, but that if we are working with all children, all teachers, and trying to work towards a place where everybody can work together and learn together, then there's a great deal of hope to be had. So moving from there, we're going to go to Latin America. I'm handing over to Lisette. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lisette Cardoso. I am from Colombia. I am Regional Education Coordinator for the Latin American and Caribbean region for Plan International. I have seven years of experience working in the humanitarian field of education in emergencies with international organizations in Colombia, such as the Norwegian Refugee Council, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and the Jesuit, service, Jesuit Refugee Service. We are very pleased to be able to show you a little about my experience of training teachers in emergency situations. Creando Aula, or Creating Classroom, is a training strategy for teachers in emergency contexts for their response to the Venezuelan migration crisis and other emergencies. In collaboration with uh, Regional Education Working Group for Latin American and Caribbean region, and specifically the Education Cannot Wait Regional Consortium. I'm going to talk to you about three key points of the presentation. The first of them, general aspects, to understand what were the teacher training needs, what were evident after the emergency of Venezuela, you understanding the context with the impact caused by the COVID-19 emergency. And it will be specific how the coordination for the production of the course was carried out. The second key point are the technical aspects and the objective of the course and those technical lines that were prioritized as a result of the identified teacher training needs, which later became contents or models for the development of the courses will be mentioned. And finally, in the third key point are the impacts and results where the achievements and scope of the implementation of the virtual course of Creando Aula in the region. So for the general aspects in context, Venezuelan crisis has caused the displacement of more than 4.7 million people, of whom 3.8 people million are in America Latina. Uh, the situation of the children is critical. UNICEF study around 1.3 million children from Venezuela are exposed of different types of violence. Early 2020 COVID-19 pandemic 
led to closure of schools and virtual distance education activated. Teachers and educational authorities in the region lack knowledge and tools to support comprehensive education for the population refugee and migrant Venezuelans. In the general aspect related with the coordination, Creando Aula or Creating Classroom was born as a virtual course on education in emergency based on the assessment of training needs for teachers who care for children in emergencies, created by the Regional Education Working Group for Latin America and Caribbean. This uh, teacher training strategy is for support educational continuity and the right to education in crisis and emergency situation. And it is like a unification of efforts and mobilization with UNICEF, Save the Children, Refugee Education Trust, World Vision, Norwegian Refugee Council, Interagency Network for Education in Emergency, INEE, Education Cannot Wait, or ECW, Plan International, like a lead implementer. Some course features or programmatic features, the course lasts eight to 10 weeks with 40 hours of dedication, four hours per week, being able to adapt according to the need of the organization that is doing the implementation. Some technical characteristics is that the course has been de developed in a web environment and fully functional on devices with Android and iOS operating system compatible with Chrome browsing. It is hosted of the thinking platform and has individual access through the website, especially designed for this purpose. Uh, the course content was delivered in this entity in PDF format and videos, which enables migration to another platform or makes it easier for some of the organization involved to add to their own platforms. So some technical aspects that were taken into account to develop the course, taking into account the objective of the course, it's a company, the teaching staff of the region of the Americas in strengthening their capacities to provide quality and gender sensitive education in emergency situation through the development of a virtual platform course called Creando Aula or Creating Classroom. And the first technical line is education in emergencies, guaranteeing basic rights. Hi, this intent highlight the important role for the teacher during the crisis and the return to places based on international standards such as INEE minimum standards for education in emergencies and the practical adaptation of the areas of the manual to the educational response in the current crisis psychosocial care and promotion of mental health in the education sector. The second technical line is well-being and social emotional skills in teachers and students. This search recognition of teachers' self-care practices, self-regulation, emotional management, resilience and social connection, social emotional learning for teachers and learners, increasing the perception of normality and routine in the students. The third uh, technical line is adaptation of the curriculum to include topics related to the emergency. And this shares curricular adaptation in emergencies, consider children emotional rehabilitation, recreation, resilience, risk prevention, and learning basic skills, flexible education, accelerated education models, and evaluation strategies that can be used in crisis situation, distance education, virtual education, blend and learning. The fourth technical line is recognition of concepts about sex, gender, gender roles, gender identity, stereotypes, understanding of gender in schools, pedagogical practices to promote gender equality, moving for, from awareness to the practice of gender sensitive educational actions to reach the transformative level. And the final technical line is appreciation of diversity promotion of interculturality and prevention against xenophobia. And its search in understanding of human mobility in Latin America, risk associated with migration and displacement for boys and girls, and the importance of the educational role in mitigating this risk, pedagogical strategies to promote inclusive education. So some impacts and results that the strategy is that 6,640 teachers from Colombia 
Ecuador, Perú, Chile, the Dominican Republic, Bolivia, Venezuela, have seeked up for the online course creating classroom. The ministers of the education of Ecuador and Chile have adopted the online course as a recommended course on their ministers of education websites, opportunity for professional growth and promotion or advancement for teachers. Teachers feel supported and not feel the course as an additional burden. And the regional group advocating for other countries to adopt the course and support it to increase the motivation for teachers. The course has been a very positive training strategy for teachers in the region, saying it has coordinated the participation and the different organization of the regional education working group. Teachers in the region have acquired greater knowledge, skills, and pedagogical tools to provide quality, inclusive, and gender-sensitive educational service in emergencies, and consider their own well-being and that of their students as an important aspect. The intervention responds to immediate humanitarian needs to the construction of peace in search for structural change, contributing to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals. For example, health and wellness, reduction of social inequalities, quality education, peace, justice, and solid institutions, and gender equality. And finally, some recommendation for the Romanian government. You could think about the development of virtual or semi-face-to-face -face teacher training according to funds and the availability of educational personnel. Consider the tools and resources that have been designed to create in classroom as a guide for you to adapt or design the teacher training strategy. Having teachers training in education in emergencies would help the Romanian government not only to respond with an adequate educational service in crisis context, but also to be prepared for possible future emergencies, leaving installed capacities in teachers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisette, that was very good. And I think it's a, a very, also a very hopeful message that's given by that presentation in, on the basis of responding to the identified needs of teachers and their holistic needs, as was referred to in earlier presentations. The teachers themselves are affected by the crisis, both the refugee and the uh, home teachers, and helping them to respond to the needs of all children can be very positive and very productive. And I think the other very important point about that presentation is the extent to which the materials were developed in collaboration with different ministries of education and then were adapted and adopted for specific countries by those ministries of education, which I think is a very important, potential, uh, potentially interesting approach for the government here also. So finally, we're going to go online to the last presentation. Uh, which, as I said, will be Camilla Lodi, who recorded it this morning for us, talking about the Better Learning Program developed by the Norwegian Refugee Council. And um, just while we're waiting for the presentation to come online, uh, and further encouragement to those of you in the room and those of you outside to please think about your questions, your comments, so that we can have a discussion. We will have hopefully nearly half an hour afterwards to have a a further um, discussion of the different points raised. Thank you. Uh, so today, um, I would like to present um, the, the story of, of, of this psychosocial support uh, um, classroom-based intervention uh, that started in Palestine in 2012 and this year actually marks the 10th year anniversary. Um, during COVID-19, um, the need in mental health and psychosocial support been up and the number of country offices where BOP started uh, to be implemented has grown by 40%. So nowadays uh, it is implemented or about to start in 26 countries um, in acute crisis or protracted conflicts. Uh, across the globe. As part of the 2022-2025 uh, Global Education NRC Strategy, 
we plan to invest in a three-year initiative to institutionalize this program in uh, every education project uh, uh, that NRC is implementing across the globe, focusing on increasing awareness on psychosocial support in education in emergency, improving uh, access also in hard-to-reach areas, and increasing uh, the quality. Um, in a snapshot, what is the Better Learning Program? So first of all, um, it was conceptualized uh, uh, and designed uh, together in collaboration with the University of Tromso and, and first piloted in 2012. It is based on the five universal principles for recovery uh, that our research uh, uh, tested. So basically, we call it a recovery box. Uh, so uh, uh, being uh, teaching uh, uh, children how to calm down, uh, providing a sense of safety and stability inside the classroom, inside the school, <clears throat> having the power to change the situation, so providing them with skills and tools, uh, connecting them with teachers and parents, uh, um, and reestablishing, finding a, a reestablished sense of hope. As you can see, uh, there are three different colors of a phased approach. Um, thinking of the traffic lights, green, yellow, and red, we start by the green, easy one, a general classroom-based psychosocial support intervention approach, focusing on techniques uh, to enhance focus and concentration in those classrooms where there are usually 10%, uh, 20% of children who have gone through acute trauma uh, or uh, uh, stress. Then we zoom into a narrower group of children who were doing well in their maths, uh, in, in their science, uh, uh, in their subjects, and then after a period of two months, drop down in their learning outcomes, uh, again, due to acute stress. And this, we work with teachers uh, um, to, on executive functioning, promoting study skills, working on routines, creating a routines on homework, how to uh, deal with exams, and, and giving tools, practical tools uh, uh, um, to improve that. And then we fi finally, we go into the more specialized uh, uh, last uh, uh, one, the Better Running Program 3. Um, which deals with uh, children who have uh, trauma-induced nightmares, which is one of the post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, um, working on with psychologists and counselors uh, uh, um, to decrease the uh, number of nightmares. So here you can see uh, just this is data uh, uh, taken from uh, the latest uh, uh, research. Of course, in these years, there has been Oral research, evaluations, after action reviews, and I would say is one of the most uh, evidence-based uh, uh, programs uh, that there are. Um, now it shows that in Jordan, for example, 87% uh, of the 600 children improved study skills. In Palestine, out of the 4,600 children, 91 reported improved well-being. Um, in Lebanon, out of the 3,000 and more children, um, 72 uh, were more hopeful about the future. Um, from data from 10 country uh, offices also shows improved well-being and connections between teachers interacting with parents uh, uh, and having a different type of approach uh, uh, with children. Uh, lastly, on average, uh, uh, across all uh, uh, the samples and countries, two-thirds of the children that go through the Better Learning Program free go down from having four to five nightmares per week uh, to zero. Um, just a quick um, snapshot on some uh, latest uh, research we have uh, presenting a correlation between improved well-being and learning outcomes. Um, again, this research was done in collaboration with the University of Tromsø in Norway, and um, Professor John Hockenshaw says that we found the intervention of the Better Learning Program 2 to be successful, and the youth reported improvement and medium to large effect sizes in all measured domains, 
So self-perceived academic functioning, well-being, self-regulation, self-efficacy, executive function, study skill, stress-related symptoms, and hope. Now, in this very uh, crowded slide, um, uh, let me just uh, give you uh, an example of, of, of the results. So we had two children, uh, 200 children from 9 to 16 uh, in experimental schools where we implemented the Better Learning Program. Two, and those are the red columns. Uh, and we had then control uh, uh, 100 children, same age, uh, in the yellow columns. Now we see that in the pretest, between the pretest and the post-test after the Better Learning Program 2, there is a, a, a considerable increase uh, for children that went through the Better Learning Program 2, while there is no change for those in the control groups. Even after five months later, same children where we did a post-post-test, we can see that those improvements still uh, remain for well-being, self-regulation, self-efficacy, and executive function and study skills. Now, these results were also compared with the Ministry of Education uh, um, um, record scorecards uh, that show increased uh, uh, performance in Arabic and in maths uh, of these uh, children, um, youth, uh, uh, that were uh, gone for the, for the program in, in Gaza. Now, my last two slides focus on the Ukraine and our CIRP response. Uh, we already had an existing office in Ukraine and now we have established a new uh, regional office in Warsaw with uh, uh, registrations also in Romania and Moldova offices. We have translated uh, the Better Learning Program manuals and the app uh, uh, in Polish, Ukrainian, Romanian, and Russian language, and we have, uh, we were there one month ago um, doing capacity building on the Better Learning Program and the teachers in crisis context uh, um, uh, to Polish partners. Uh, um, we have established two partnerships uh, to support formal system, but also to support education in transitional centers uh, in the NRC Transit Center near the main station in Warsaw, and you can see here uh, the picture. In Romania, uh, we have a partnership with RAA, Education uh, Supporting Refugee Children and Young People Access Non-Formal Education and Free National Youth Platforms, uh, supporting host community and displaced Ukrainian youth, uh, become active, engage members in their community and choose their transition into education pathways uh, or uh, could be livelihood opportunity. All of this improving uh, uh, well-being and focusing on this. In Moldova, uh, we had a partnership with three uh, partners supporting the former system and the National Youth Council and youth-led action, improving quality of their humanitarian action. Um, so all of this to say that the, the type of intervention needs to really be holistic and uh, we cannot do mental health PSS if teachers do not have appropriate uh, um, techniques and approaches uh, uh, to increase a classroom uh, uh, classroom management and and re-establish a sense of hope uh, uh, inside the classroom. Two recommendations from our side on the urgency to implement mental health and psychosocial support in education in emergency based on the research that has been carried out. We need to work uh, in, as soon as possible on uh, restoring all the principles we spoke about and then also plan for longer term funding. Um, uh, as education experts, we're working on learning outcomes and we know uh, that there, there needs to be a longer term funding uh, to support research as well as capacity development plans to improve the quality of service delivery and developing more sustainable interventions. Um, thanks to all, uh, find below uh, the Better Learning Program newsletter uh, link and uh, um, my email. Thanks. Yes, Camilla, in case you're online, we're really happy to have been able to see you today. And thank you for recording that just this morning so that we were able to uh, include your presentation as planned. 
Just before I hand over to Radu, I'd like to just make the comment that um, I think that last presentation is very helpful in unpacking for us what we mean by well-being, that it's based on those very human skills of self-confidence, self-efficacy, working together, that all-important connection with other people, um, and then which supports working in a group, being able to think critically, solve problems together with other, other people, uh, and make good decisions. And all of that supports that resilience, the, the capacity to, to bounce back, to keep hope, which was the last point that um, Camilla made. And I think that this, this particular program demonstrates the, the value of working together with teachers and learners, and I think by extension their families, on these issues can really help in the overall well-being of all children and teachers, the whole community, not just the refugee ones. So finally, I'd just like to leave you with three words, or yeah, groups of words that I think kind of capture what we've tried to present in these, this panel, but also which links back to the earlier sessions also, what's already being done in Romania and the discussions around what, could build, what we could build upon. So the first one is indeed well-being, the well-being of of teachers and learners and their families will support quality education and will affect also positively those academic results, which are often considered to be the basics, but for which we really need that well-being, that holistic approach. Secondly, collaboration and coordination. It's been really made clear throughout how important that is from the government around everybody, uh, including everybody, I should say. And of course, that links into funding and the importance of that collaborative approach to try to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to go and is used in the best way. And then finally, flexibility. And I think this is an area that has come out, or a theme that's come out many times. We need to be able to adapt, we need to be able to respond. Well-being, collaboration, coordination, and flexibility. And I'm going to now hand over to Radu. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison, for leading us through these three presentations. And thanks to all the three speakers, even if the third one probably cannot hear us. Um, OK, I think the summary that you've made is very uh, was very enlightening. It drew our attention to three main aspects which we have to be aware of, well-being, collaboration, and flexibility. And these are not only to do with refugee crisis, but are things that we should always be aware of and be conscious of when we talk about education, whether it is for vulnerable children or for mainstream communities. Um, I'd like to go back to something that Benoit said in the first in his first in the first intervention, and um, he said. Online education with Ukrainian curriculum should not be seen as an alternative to integration of Ukrainian children into Romanian schools. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Because for a while now we have been debating this, whether it is a good idea to allow Ukrainian communities to set up their own learning spaces within Romanian schools premises where they work with Ukrainian teachers and with Ukrainian curricula from most of them uh, online with teachers from from uh, Ukraine and uh, while well, for us this was something new we were considering whether it is a good and an innovative practice or whether it has potential negative effect, effects. Um, I'd like, if you could, that's my first question and then we'll take the floor. But I, I, I really was struck by that remark of yours. So um, could you just elaborate a bit on it, if, if you don't mind? Why, why would it be, or why do you see it as uh, the worst alternative of the two? in the context where most children and families that we talk to tell us that they are here only temporarily and they want to return home as fast as possible. Where, where shall I as go? you wish. No, we can move this to... No, it, it cannot move. Oh. I will try to respond from here. It's good to stand for a while, actually. Um, 
I think the key word is temporary. Temporary. Do we know how long the conflict will last? Uh, I think nobody, nobody is able to say that at this stage. And um, the kind of situation where refugees would flee their country and seek asylum in their neighboring countries for a couple of months, a couple of years, is, is gone. We've seen that emergencies, the nature of emergencies, has become protracted. And this is the reason why we say that the most sustainable way to provide quality certified education to refugees is actually inclusion into national education systems. But as I said earlier, we don't have a magic wand. Pink inclusion has happened. It takes time. And this is why, in my last point, I was referring to all the materials that has been digital materials that has been developed by the Ukrainian Ministry of Education. We think that this material could be used for the transition. It could be used to support education. But still, we are convinced, um, based on our experience, not only about what the Global Compact on Refugees is actually telling us, based on our experience, this is the best way forward. Because, and I come back to my first point, who can tell us how long this conflict will last and how long will it take for the situation in Ukraine to permit return in safety and dignity, meaning access to education on the other side in schools that have been rebuilt, renovated. All that will take time. Thanks. I don't mind. I can use either language. Translation is both ways, but I suppose English speakers have got headsets while the others have not. Okay, schimb limba de comunicare atunci. Înțeleg la limba română. Nu îmi dădeam seama dacă toată lumea are căști de traducere, dar îmi dădeam seama că doar cei care vorbesc engleză și nu vorbesc românești, în general. Deci e un aspect important care trebuie avut în vedere din perspectiva Ministerului Educației. Noi oricum lucrăm de câțiva ani de zile la o strategie națională de monitorizare a segregării școlare și la o strategie de desegregare școlară. Și era și o temere a mea că în momentul în care creăm aceste buzunare de comunități de copii ucrainieni în sistemul de învățământ românesc, care deja are elemente de segregare sistemică, tradiționale, să nu subminăm, de fapt, un efort mai larg de integrare și incluziune, care, de fapt, ne ia foarte, sau presupune foarte multe eforturi. Haideți să vedem dacă sunt întrebări din, din sală sau din online. Nu știu cine preia întrebările din online, vă mărturisesc. Alison, is it you who takes questions from online? Yes, there isn't anything. There isn't anything at the moment. Vă rog, doamnă, căutați un microfon în spatele dumneavoastră, în stânga. Just. Am să spun în românește ca să nu existe neînțelegeri. Eric Aștar, sunt director general de GSPC Arad. Um, am identificat în Arad copii ucrainieni veniți cu mamele lor, care sunt angajatele unei firme, iar copiii învață online cu profesorii din Ucraina. Întrebarea mea este dacă Ministerul Educației și-a făcut o strategie sau aveți o metodologie pentru a recunoaște de fapt aceste cursuri pe care copiii le fac, chiar zilnic intră ore întregi, online cu profesorii de acolo, pentru că deci nu pot să meargă la școală, nici nu vor să se înscrie la școală la noi, vor să continue studiile cu profesorii lor de acolo. Dacă cumva v-ați gândit cum să rezolvați această problemă. Și cred că este o problemă până la urmă. Copiii merg la școală, practic ei își fac cursurile și tot, și au ajuns la noi și noi dacă poate peste o perioadă de... poate rămân la noi mamele acestea cu copiii ăia, noi nu le recunoaștem această perioadă de, de cursuri. 
la această oră. Da, um, e Mulțumesc. cam în același sens discuția cu, ce, cu întrebarea pe care eu pusesem eu um, lui Benua. Da, existau, au existat discuții în acest sens la nivelul Ministerului Educației, însă întrebarea este în acest context și de aia suntem aici să încercăm să găsim niște răspunsuri împreună, dacă acel model este unul care trebuie încurajat sau nu. Din ce am auzit acum din experiențele internaționale, nu trebuie încurajat. Adică ar trebui ca acei copii să fie integrați în învățământul românesc alături de copii români și să nu încurajăm predarea la distanță după curiculum ucrainean. Este un punct de vedere care ne-a fost prezentat și pe care o să-l aprofundăm. Însă să nu uităm că recunoașterea studiilor internaționale este supusă unor reguli. Dacă în momentul de față copiii aceia studiază după curiculum ucrainean, în limba ucraineană, cu profesori din Ucraina, ei sunt înscriși în Ucraina la școală, primesc certificare și la un moment dat, la orice moment din, din viață, dacă decid să-și întrerupă studiile acolo și să se transfere într-o școală românească, studiile le sunt echivalate. Deci orice copil din Ucraina sau tânăr intră în România, se poate transfera în sistemul românesc de învățământ. Dacă o perioadă continuă aici, cu profesorii ucraineni, poate ulterior. Dar e, e o condiție, trebuie să fie totuși înregistrat la o școală în Ucraina și să aibă dovada studiilor. Este, cred că, o dorință umană să vrei să te întorci. Da, este, este într-adevăr. Cred că în situația aceasta este uman să vrea să se întoarcă, doar că nu știm când și nu știm la ce se pot întoarce. Și atunci este o, o situație care are mai multe fațete și trebuie să le avem în vedere pe, pe toate. Nu mi-aș dori, cum spuneam, pe de o parte nu sunt nici adeptul segregării. Echipa actuală din Ministerul Educației într-adevăr a pus sub semnul întrebării acest model din perspectiva segregării, însă nu putem nici să gândim din perspectiva obligării acestor copii să se înscrie în învățământul uh, românesc. Al treilea cuvânt pe care l-a dat uh, Alison era flexibilitate. Deci trebuie să găsim niște soluții care să-i încurajeze să învețe, dar în același timp să le dea șanse egale și dacă rămân aici și dacă se întorc. Nu avem soluția, de aia suntem aici să discutăm. Uh, doamnă. Eu sunt Didi de la Asociația de Ajutor a Mortel. Am fost activ la Vama de Siret um, cu intervenții de um, psihologie de emergență și cu um, uh, Siret.help, de exemplu. Acum suntem parteneri cu NRC și facem service mapping. Aș vrea să știu ce fel de um, oportunități sunt pentru copii în vara asta să fie incluși, nu știu, în niște tablele de vară, dacă este ceva oficial organizat și cum putem noi să promovăm asta. Că intenționăm să mergem cu o echipă mobilă și să comunicăm direct cu refugiați. Deocamdată nu sunt definitivate, adică nu vă pot da un program, însă există o metodologie în lucru pentru școli de vară. Dumnezeu ați numit tabere, noi ne gândeam exclusiv la școli de vară, de învățare a limbii române și eventual ceva despre cultura și civilizația românească, însă dacă vă gândiți la tabere în care să uh, lucrezi sau să se joace împreună cu copii uh, români, este o opțiune la care putem să ne gândim, așteptăm propuneri. Vă rog, microfon. Mulțumesc mult! Sunt Iolanda Florescu din partea Fundației Naționale pentru Tineret. Salut și vă felicit pentru organizarea acestei conferințe și vreau să vă ajut, domnule consilier. Dacă ați fi adus la masă și colegii din Ministerul Tineretului, cei care se ocupă de tineret, v-ar fi dat soluția pentru tabere, pentru că ei păstoresc acest domeniu, taberele pentru copii, și au și o prioritate în acest sens, să susțină copiii refugiați din Ucraina, deci tabere pentru, pentru copii. Tot vorbim despre tineret, ținând cont de faptul că, potrivit legii tinerilor, a fi tânăr în România înseamnă să ai vârsta cuprinsă între 14 și 35 de ani, 
Pe mine mă surprinde puțin că văd absența organizațiilor pentru tineret, văd absența autorităților de profil, mai ales în ideea în care, în domeniul acesta, pe noi ne preocupă foarte mult integrarea tinerilor în comunitate, stimularea participărilor, cum reușim să auzim vocea tânărului, mai ales a tânărului refugiat și, bineînțeles, să dezvoltăm competențe și deprinderi de viață independentă, lucruri de care tinerii refugiați au nevoie. Așa că poate ar trebui cumva să ne gândim cum include mai activ și mai concret și domeniul tineretului, mai ales în zona de învățare non-formală. Mulțumesc! Și eu mulțumesc! Nu, nu am ce să vă răspund decât că vă așteptăm la masa discuțiilor. Nu, din câte știu eu, la nivelul guvernului, deși nu am fost implicat direct în task force, există și Ministerul Tineretului și reprezentanții organizațiilor de tineret. Deci nu, nu văd dacă doamna Mădălina Turza vrea să comenteze, însă, însă din perspectiva Ministerului Educației suntem foarte foarte deschiși, în ciuda faptului că educația non-formală nu este întotdeauna uh, atât de bine integrată în, în modul de lucru din școlile din România. Dați drumul microfonului 7, vă rog. De Imediat, aici? acum. Aici, okay. Merge. Aș fi vrut să completez și eu intervenția domnului Radu Sechei. Mulțumesc mult pentru accentul pus pe, pe zona de tineret. Cei, cei, cei drept sunt doar organizații neguvernamentale prezente din zona de tineret, însă așa cum probabil știți, planul de măsuri pe care l-am dezvoltat la nivelul guvernului în ceea ce privește integrarea și protecția refugiaților din Ucraina în România, are o secțiune dedicată tineretului cu măsuri la care au participat organizațiile reprezentative de pe zona de tineret și coordonat de Ministerul Tineretului. Știu foarte sigur că acolo sunt incluse măsuri legate de, să spunem, incluziunea și protecția tinerilor refugiați și tocmai de aceea cred că a avut o parte foarte relevantă din capitolul dedicat copiilor și tinerilor, însă cu siguranță colegii de la educație sunt deschiși să dialogueze în continuare cu dumneavoastră. Mulțumesc! Dacă mai sunt alte întrebări, nu înțeleg că în online nu sunt încă, nu, nu au fost întrebări. Dacă nu... O să încerc să um, fac o, un scurt rezumat înainte de a-i da lui Alison posibilitatea să încheie um, acest panel, această discuție. Cred că un lucru pe care noi l-am um, observat la Ministerul Educației este într-adevăr nevoia de a comunica mai mult direct către comunitățile de U ucrainieni care se formează în uh, România. Și în acest sens vom avea nevoie de sprijinul organizațiilor non-guvernamentale, al fundațiilor care funcționează, pentru că noi nu avem pârghii să-i atingem direct. Informația este disponibilă pe site-ul Ministerului Educației. Există tot ceea ce, toate drepturile pe care le au și tot ce pot să obțină pentru copiilor este uh, disponibil. Informația este disponibilă pe site, însă pentru a ajunge la ei direct și a-i a implica direct în procesul de... de Mi-a plăcut termenul de curriculum shift, este nevoie de grassroots, de, de societatea civilă. Un alt lucru pe care l-am observat, deci pe lângă communication is key, este nevoia de uh, suport uh, psihoemoțional sau învățare socioemoțională. Sunt uh, copii care au nevoie de sprijin suplimentar pentru a, a atinge un nivel de performanță educațională anterior uh, dislocărilor 
din cauza războiului. Și un, alt, un ultim aspect care cred că, de care cred că trebuie să ne ocupăm cu celeritate în Ministerul Educației este formarea cadrelor didactice pentru a-i putea sprijini și pe copiii români și pe copiii ucrainieni. Integrarea, incluziunea este un drum cu două sensuri și nu putem să vorbim doar despre integrarea copiilor ucrainieni în sistemul de învățământ românesc, ci de un proces inclusiv care să îi învețe, revenind la una din competențele cheie de care vorbea Jacques Delors în raportul său de acum, cred că, 30 de ani, Learning to live together and learning to be. Este dincolo de procesul de învățare, este a învăța să fim împreună. Și uh, pentru asta este, consider, eu și considerăm noi că este uh, exagerat sau nedrept să ne așteptăm ca profesorii din România, fără o pregătire suplimentară, să uh, fie aruncați în această situație. Și din discuțiile pe care le-am avut în ultima vreme cu uh, fundațiile și organizațiile care ne-au oferit ajutorul, cred că suntem pe cale de a găsi o, o modalitate de a, de a oferi acest sprijin. Uh, vreau să mulțumesc încă o dată prezentatorilor, celor trei invitați și uh, sper să fructificăm ceea ce am discutat aici în niște programe foarte concrete de, de colaborare. Mulțumesc. Thank you. You can close the session. Thank you very much, Radu and the all of the presenters. Um, I just like to comment as a, a final comment today how much potential there is for positive next steps. Somebody in the break said, what are going to be the next steps of this conference where we've shared many ideas? And your last comment there about the need to work together with grassroots organizations, with teachers, with the refugees to listen and understand, communicate, and try to decide together how best to move forward, I think is a really positive uh, note to close on. Um, and I really hope that it starts laying the foundation for ongoing discussions, more technical discussions, going into detail, um, and with the support from those of us who can come from the outside with experience from out elsewhere um, that may be useful. And so just as a reminder, before we finally close, that the resources will be, uh, will be adding to the resource bank that's online. Uh, so I really encourage you to go and have a look, um, and we will continue to make sure that everything is, is in one place so that it's easier for everybody to share the ideas and, and potential. So thanks again, everybody. And I'm not sure right now if we're taking a break or if we're going straight into the next session. Can we possibly have a break, please? Yes. <laughs> we'll take an executive decision from here then, shall we? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We need to uh, hand over there, sorry. Um, the break, I, um, I don't know if there is a break between the two, two panel sessions, Vikrant. There is a scheduled break, yes. yes. There so is 15. a break for 15 minutes, but it's advisable to go to the next session now because we are behind schedule. <laughs> Ok. Bun. Eu vă propun cu voia dumneavoastră să, să mergem la următorul panel ca să avem o, o, sesiune, o pauză mai mare înainte de final și de concluzii, unde vă puteți um, lua și diplomele și unde mai putem discuta și informal despre, um, despre problemele pe care le aveți, dar și despre pașii pe care îi vom face de acum încolo. Așa că um, o să invit următorul panel, care este pe zona de protecție a copilului, să se alăture uh, nouă și să intrăm deja în, uh, în următorul subiect. Mulțumesc prezentatorilor și celor care au intervenit. Sunt absolut convinsă că în uh, final, la zona de concluzii, vom puncta o serie de, uh, de aspecte care au reieșit și din acest, uh, din acest panel pe zona de educație. De asemenea, ce aș vrea eu să vă spun acum până se face schimbul între paneluri este legat de importanța acestui moment în sensul în care 
Dincolo de instrumentele și materialele pe care le aveți la dispoziție pe Memory Stick și care vor fi de asemenea puse la dispoziție pe platforma care este gata în acest moment online de care v-am spus, unde veți accesa, cred că e foarte important să rămânem în contact și să rămâneți în contact cu experții internaționali prezenți astăzi aici. Ceea ce ne dorim este să creăm o rețea activă de suport, astfel încât la întrebările de natură practică și tehnică la care aveți nevoie de răspunsuri pe partea de implementare în educație, dar și pe zona de protecție, să aveți um, un contact sau o persoană pe care să o puteți întreba prin mail sau prin care, cu care să puteți stabili o legătură de comunicare. Sunt absolut convinsă că partenerii internaționali sunt deschiși să, să, să sprijine și în acest fel pe de-o parte, iar pe de altă parte sunt convinsă că mulți dintre ei care deja activează în România sunt deschiși să sprijine și instituțional, deopotrivă Ministerul Educației, dar și zona de protecție a copilului, acolo unde este nevoie cu expertiză tehnică, cu um, um, informații, materiale, dar de ce nu și cu implicare directă. Mulțumesc mult și invit cel de-al doilea panel, doamna Cristina Cuculas, dacă se poate și ceilalți, vă rog să, să treceți în față pentru a putea vorbi, pentru că acolo sunt microfoane. So, uh, good afternoon to you all, and welcome to the session on good practices on child protection. So, as we heard from the speakers from early this morning, that one of the objectives of this uh, conference is to bring together humanitarian actors and government officials and other invited guests who have also worked in other operations to share the experiences from those operations as good practices for inspiration, and maybe those good practices can be adapted to the situation in Romania. So we have with us today three presenters who will present to us good practices from different uh, operations where they have worked. And what we will do is I will introduce each of them. Each of them will present a good practice, and then Miss Christina will wrap it up by uh, linking it to the Romanian situation so that she brings it down to the Romanian situation and help us to understand how that good practice can be adopted and possibly used in the Romania context. So the good practices help us to uh, understand what has happened in the other locations, what lessons the other operations have learned as they went along adopting certain practices, and therefore we can draw some inspiration from this and adopt it to the Romania situation. So the first example will be from Anita. So I will introduce Anita. I will uh, give you some information about Anita. So Anita is um, the Plan International's global lead on child protection in emergencies. And she has over 15 years of working experience in the field of, of child protection, mental health and psychosocial support in the humanitarian sector. She has worked globally directly managed uh, child protection in emergencies in various situations in Asia, Middle East, and Europe. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology, specializing in child psychology. In 2015, she worked in Germany, where there was a humanitarian situation. There was an influx of uh, refugees arriving in Germany, starting from 2015, and she was one of the staff that worked there in the response. So she will share with us a good practice on what the humanitarian actors in Germany did in the child protection context. So Anita, over to you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present and participate in this very important event. I hope you still have some energy. Uh, please don't leave. <laughs> there are still uh, three very good uh, child protection practices that we would like to present. The uh, case study I'm going to present comes from Germany. Yes. And uh, it's a case study I'm sure will resonate a lot uh, with you because uh, um, it has to do with the development of uh, standards for the protection of children, adolescents, and women within uh, um, refugee accommodation centers. Mm. I'm sure many of you have worked in transit shelter at the very beginning of the crisis. Next, please. Let me tell you something about the context. Um, we are in Germany. I'm sure you will remember between 2014 and 2015, due to political instability in the Middle East and in parts of uh, Africa, um, the number of people seeking asylum in Germany reached uh, an historic peak, with almost one million people being registered in Germany um, as asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people at that time came from Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq. Next slide, please. Um, the initial response from the government and from civil society organizations focused on uh, uh, emergency reception centers. Those were emergency facilities where refugees were accommodated after they enter into the country and after they um, lodge their asylum claim. Um, normally, in normal times, uh, those centers are run by government, but because of the high influx of refugee, the government asks civil society organizations to um, support them and run some of those centers. Mm -hmm. In ideal times, uh, refugees spend something like uh, two to three months in those centers. But once more, because at that time the number of claims uh, the government was processing was very high, most of the refugees ended up spending up to 24 months uh, in the center. And I would like you to take 30 seconds to, no, back, <laughs> back, back. I will tell you when you can. I would like you to take 30 seconds to appreciate some of the pictures of the uh, reception center. Maybe you can look at the one on the right. This is a center where I um, working for, for quite some time. Um, this was an old electronics factory which uh, was converted in a reception center. As you can see, it was uh, um, an open space, very small, with no windows, very uh, high ceilings. Um, it was overcrowded. At that time, I remember there was uh, more than 600 people in that center. All mix up, families with children, adolescent girls, single men, they were all together in the same room. And as you can see, um, residents of the centers, they did their best to try to uh, ensure some, some privacy. They basically um, created their own mini compartments. Um, they fence off the, the space. Sorry, the picture is a little bit far, but um, they, I hope you can see that they fence off uh, the space in between beds with some pieces uh, and sheets of cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. So it is in this context that uh, um, Plan International has started a collaboration with the government in the state of Hamburg. Um, I hope you know by now that one of our expertise is uh, child protection, and so we were asked to work alongside um, civil society organizations and local authorities in order to ensure that reception centers could meet protection standards and provide a protective environment for children, adolescents, and their caregivers. So our starting point was to conduct uh, consultation with children and caregivers, and really to understand from them um, what are some of the issues. Mm? We also consulted with the staff and volunteers working um, in the reception centers in order to try to analyze all aspects of management through a protection lens. 
you see on the slide there are four uh, boxes. The uh, findings from the consultation uh, are many. I try to summarize the findings in uh, four main uh, topics. And uh, um, I won't have the time to go through all the findings, but maybe I can share with you some of the main highlights. Um, one of the findings that we observed around uh, child safeguarding was the fact that uh, pretty much all the reception centers didn't have any safeguarding policy or procedure in place. Let me give an example. The access to a reception center was uh, unrestricted and unlimited. Um, everybody could enter into the centers. Staff, volunteers, visitors, journalists, everybody could enter without uh, um, providing any ID document. No safeguarding check was, uh, was done. And I'm sure you understand that this posed a uh, major protection risk for uh, residents of the centers. Um, in terms of uh, staff competencies, we um, took some time to sit down with the staff and volunteers and really try to understand what are some knowledge and competence that you have. And uh, we came to the conclusion that most of the staff and volunteers working in those centers didn't have any prior knowledge in terms of uh, how to work with children, how to communicate with children, how to organize participatory activities with uh, uh, adolescents. They didn't have any familiarity with uh, humanitarian and protection standards. And most importantly, they didn't have the language and cultural skills that were needed at that time to work with refugees. I believe you remember there were four uh, main uh, refugee uh, groups, um, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. So it was important for staff and volunteers to have some of the language and cultural skills that were required to work with this different group of refugees. We also um, realized that there were several child protection issues across uh, um, the different centers. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that uh, um, we observed a high level of uh, psychosocial distress um, among uh, caregivers, but also among adolescents. This was due to the living condition. It was also due to the fact that it was very unclear for them what was going to happen uh, in the future. And also, we observed the um, increased vulnerability across all centers to risks such as sexual violence, sexual harassment, trafficking. Let me maybe show you a drawing that uh, some, some children made. Next one, please. Um, this is a map that children made of, the, of one of the centers they were living in as part of an activity that we call risk mapping which is an activity where we ask children to draw the place where they live and identify areas where they feel safe and happy and areas where they feel unhappy and unsafe. And uh, um, I will try to interpret this drawing for you. Uh, basically, you can see there's a, a part of the drawing which is all red. Um, this was actually the path between the reception center and the washing facilities. And uh, through this drawing and through the exchanges with children, we came to realize that uh, that path was identified by children as extremely dangerous because the washing facilities were located outside the reception center. They were at the end of a long and badly lit uh, path. And normally, um, around the washing facilities, specifically in the evening and at night, single men used to um, 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 hang around, uh, chat, uh, smoke shisha, and so it was extremely intimidating for girls and women to use the washing facilities at night. They were really scared. Mm -hmm. This is why we came to understand that uh, as a coping strategy, they told us that every day, Starting from 3 p.m., they were stopped drinking water. Um, we also uh, try to understand what were the um, services which, are, which were offered in the reception center to children, adolescents, and their caregivers. And we um, came to the conclusion that uh, there was very little in terms of services specifically tailored to their needs. 
And most importantly, I think I don't remember now because it's at the end of the day, but it's a comment that has been already made by uh, one of the previous speakers. Um, what we observed is that uh, very little attempt was made in each reception center to um, consult with refugees, to give them a space to voice their, their, their concerns, propose the solutions. All the decisions were taken by the management of the different uh, organization, and uh, um, no space was given to a refugee to uh, understand uh, what was their opinion with regards to decisions that were uh, uh, important to them. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Um, it wasn't like that originally. Um, so it is uh, in this uh, context that uh, um, under the leadership of the government, with the support from UNICEF and in cooperation with all the child protection agencies which were working in Germany at the moment, um, a pilot project was launched. The aim of the pilot project was to try to improve the protective environment within the reception center, uh, to ensure that the environment was a supportive one for children and their caregivers, and uh, um, the idea behind was to try to develop some standards mm, that all the, st all the reception centers should have met in order to promote the protection of children and their caregivers. So unfortunately, you can't see the slide, but um, this pilot project included four steps. Mm. Number one, all the, um, the different actors that I've mentioned to you came together to um, try to develop uh, a package of child protection services um, that uh, um, should be offered in the reception center. And then we tested this package. So the first phase was really very much about testing and piloting. We took a few months to test whether the package of services that we proposed was the right one. Then we moved to the second phase. The second phase uh, was about um, training as many staff and volunteers as possible in order for them to become familiar with the package of services and in order for them to become more able to implement the child protection intervention which were part of this package of services. And also we were creating opportunities every month. We were coming together and we were really sharing our experiences and lessons learned about the implementation of the of the package hmm? and try to understand what works, what doesn't work, what are the methodologies that seems to be most effective. And then we move on to the third phase, which was the development of standards. So based on uh, um, our experience, based on uh, um, the lesson learned that we were able to collect, based also on the feedback that we were constantly receiving from refugees, because throughout the pilot phase, we were consulting the refugees and asking them, uh, what, are, uh, what are your needs? Are the services that you are providing fine with you? Is there something missing? And so we put all this information together and we were able to develop some standards. I hope you can see the next slide. Okay, good. Um, so those are standards that were created at national level for the protection of children, adolescents, and women within uh, um, accommodation centers. You can see there are two versions because one was issued in 2016 and the other one was issued in 2021. This is because uh, since the start, uh, we were very clear that we wanted to review the standards at a regular basis in order to be able to, in to incorporate in the newer version lessons learned from the, around the implementation of the standard coming both from uh, staff and volunteers, but also from refugees. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have there uh, um, a page which shows uh, what were the main chapters of the standards, but maybe I can tell you that uh, the standards were covering a different range of topics, um, such as, for example, uh, what to do when you identify a case of violence and abuse and exploitation in the reception center. Who do you need to report this case to? Um, there was also information around how you should conduct uh, a protection risk assessment in the center and how you should uh, 
implement measures to mitigate risk uh, that you have uh, identified. There was, also the, there, there was also a lot of information around how to uh, protect data and how to ensure confidentiality uh, of very sensitive information. Um, there was also information around uh, um, competencies and values that all staff and volunteers working in the reception center should display and master. Um, and there was also a section around how to work uh, together with refugees and involve them in service provision and how to leverage uh, their uh, professional and language skills to make sure that they can also be part of uh, uh, the different intervention. Next slide, please. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't like that. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to share with you, this is the last slide, I'm going to share with you some of the lessons that we learned um, through this, uh, this process. Number one, it's very important to have standards because uh, standards uh, enable you to establish common principles and uh, enable you to harmonize protection intervention. So even if you end up having 150 reception center, if you have standards, you can try to harmonize the services that you provide across uh, all the 150 reception center. But also having standards uh, enable you to better communicate on uh, what are the key child protection gaps and needs? Because somehow, even today, we are different practitioners coming from everywhere, but if we have standards, it means that we have a common framework, we have a common narrative, and we can all make analysis based on this common narrative that we have created together. Also, as you've heard, we involved refugees in the development of the standard and their input were really taken into consideration into the design of the standard. This meant that we were really able to put refugee at the center. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important to acknowledge that refugees are not just the recipients of humanitarian aid. They are people with capacity, with decision-making skills, and so they need to be involved in decisions that uh, matter to them. And as I said before, we need to make sure that we also utilize their professional skills. Um, at that time, we had uh, uh, psychologists among the refugees, we had teachers, but we also had carpenters. We had a lot of people with skills uh, um, that could support really the, uh, the service provision. Um, another lesson learned has to do with uh, um, the implementation of the standard. I'm sure you agree with me that uh, one thing is uh, have a nice booklet with standards, and another thing is uh, applying the standards. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that all the reception centers in Germany at that time uh, were using the standards as a guideline, um, what we uh, discussed is that, well, first of all, all the local authorities in Germany adopted the standard. This was one of the first steps. And second, and probably even most importantly, the local authorities decided to integrate the standards as part of the contracts they were signing with the civil society organization. Mm -hmm. So whenever local authorities were asking civil society organization to run uh, uh, some of the centers, as part of their contract, they were uh, integrating uh, the standards. So somehow the standards were made mandatory and they were really encouraging organizations to use them. And I have a final lesson learned, so I'm done, um, which is really about coordination. Um, it was, for me, um, being part of this experience, it was very rich, it has been very rich because uh, different actors contributed to the development of the standard. Representatives from the refugee community, from civil society organization, from government institution, from UN agencies. And uh, so the standards in the end could really benefit from different perspectives, different practices, and different experiences. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Anita, for, that, uh, for sharing with us that good practice from Germany. What we will do in the interest of time, we will call upon the next speaker to share her experience with us. And then once we are done with all the three uh, good practices, and then we will wrap it up, link it to the Romanian situation, see how the good practices maybe can, um, can, be, can be adapted to the Romanian situation to the extent possible, and then we'll open it up for questions. So if you allow me, I will introduce the next speaker, and her name is Ms. Teresa Wallace. So she's here with us. She's our Technical Director of Quality Innovation for World Visions International Child Protection and Participation Team. She has 20 years of working experience in designing, monitoring, and evaluating programs aimed at strengthening child and adolescent well-being, and her focus is on children who are facing adverse circumstances. So she has a master's degree in child development with a focus on adverse effects of violence on the development of children. She'll be sharing with us a good practice from her working experience in Armenia, so we invite her to share this with us. Over to you. Teresa. Good afternoon. All right. You all, I think that everyone has been so patient. I believe that we need an energizer of some sort. Can we just do at least some sort of stretching? Do you want to stand up? Let's just at least stand up if you don't mind not leaving. We are going to do some yoga. We're going to stretch up, 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 as high as you can. We're going to go this way as far as you can. Uh, then we're going to go the other way as far as you can. Oh, then we're going to do what, just like we do with children, where you shake it out. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. One, two. One, one. All right? All right. Thank you. Did that help a little? A little? Okay. If you need another one, let me know. Okay, I'm ready to start. I want to thank the organizers, uh, the Government of Romania and Plan International, um, and uh, the panel, Selena and Anita, for uh, the opportunity to share. And I'm going to be sharing about some lessons learned from this class project in Armenia. All right, Robert, next. The CLASS project stands for Community Level Access to Social Services, and this was a project focused on building the capacity of community social workers uh, in Armenia. It uh, was funded by USAID in partnership with the government uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs from 2017 to 2020. And it uh, worked on, first of all, developing the sub sector regulating documents that you see there, the community social worker job description, um, education guide, and working toolkit. It also developed the Community Social Worker course in collaboration with Yerevan State University. And as a result, 91 community social workers graduated from the program and were then established in communities across um, Armenia in uh, Mars, those are the smallest political uh, geographic boundaries. And uh, you can go, Robert. 
and click one time. And as a result, more than 42,000 individuals received counseling, and that was a part of on-the-job training. So this is background for what I'm going to share with you about today. This was success of establishing and strengthening uh, the community social worker and the child protection system with the government of Armenia. Okay, Robert. Now, the context in Armenia is similar to Romania, but in 2020, they had two crisis situations that you're aware of. The first was the pandemic. It spread to Armenia in March of 2020, and by reports of May 2021, there were 200,000 cases that had spread across all regions of Armenia and more than 4,000 deaths. The second crisis situation hit Armenia in September of 2020 with um, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict that reignited. And so there were more than 90,000 people that fled to Armenia. And so 11,000 of those displaced families were in communities that were with these same community social workers that were part of this class project. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, Robert? So in December of 2020, there was a study done of these community social workers who've now gone through this program and now experienced two crisis situations. So through a mixed method survey, 50 of these community social workers were interviewed to understand their needs and perspectives following these crises, to understand what was it like for them uh, and uh, how, did it, how did it work? And so I'm going to share some of the findings from this study to see how it might be applicable for you. All right, Robert. Three overarching challenges faced by the community social workers. The first was the sheer significant expansion of their workload. The majority of them said, uh, particularly with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, that it was just too much on their workload. So you think of the community social worker job description normally, and now this intense workload on top of that. Second, approximately half of the community social workers shared that they were feeling depressed themselves, working with these war-affected families. And uh, you're going to hear more of that from what I share. I think we have to consider that. Uh, there's more about that. And third was the acute lack of funding at the local level, because they had just experienced uh, COVID-19, and so at the local level, the social assistance funds were drained. Now comes another crisis, and so at the local community level, there's no more funding now to draw down from to respond. So, next slide, Robert. The government of Armenia does respond with three types of cash assistance programs. The first is for those who are Artsakh citizens. The second is for host families. And the third is for Artsakh children of preschool age. But what you notice here is uh, that there's not funding for other type of uh, immediate needs. And that's what the community social workers share, 
they highlight funding needs for a range of other things such as mental health, psychosocial support, medical assistance, uh, prenatal care, uh, education, relief, immediate uh, relief distribution, including food, baby food, uh, blankets, etc. Whole range. Next slide. So these are more detailed challenges identified by the community social workers. Uh, the first, uh, these are listed in order of the most reported to less so. So the first was uh, reported family dissatisfaction and complaints and how to manage those, right? Because that can become very challenging and there are psychosocial issues there as we know. Uh, with a refugee crisis. The second, as I mentioned, the lack of material res resources. The third, then, the lack of professional resources. And this could be, as was already discussed today, the lack of mental health and psychosocial support to be able to refer and respond. Uh, just sheer physical exhaustion uh, and in some locations, not all, but the lack of relationship within that local community uh, authority, like the local city hall or mayor's office. Uh, with the, uh, the cash assistant programs, there wasn't, and this was especially in larger cities, there wasn't enough awareness raising or communication tools about those programs. And so this put it on the, the community social workers to try and communicate to uh, the families. And um, just general, as I said earlier, feelings of being emotionally overwhelmed and uh, depressed. Next slide. So the colors did not show up, but you, you can get a sense of where the bars might be. Uh, when asked what the community social worker saw as the biggest child protection risk, by far the number one risk they reported uh, is education. Isn't that interesting? And we've been talking about the importance of integration all day. And they identified it as the number one risk. And there was a lot of stories within the qualitative about the work they did to get children online education or in school. Uh, and uh, due to time, I won't go into all of that. You also see psychological problems there. And what you also see reflected here in terms of difficulty in adjusting ongoing insecurity and the worsening of social condition is also reflecting the host community. This is not just the refugee children. All right, next slide. Uh, this also is not uh, showing the slide appropriately, but I think I can still communicate what's going on here. So within the um, original project was the development of this class toolkit. And this, these are the tools that a social worker uses when they go to a household to assess and document and report. Well, uh, what is identified here is that during the crises, the social workers found it difficult to use those tools. What you see here is that the social workers um, did not. Uh, you see them saying, I was too busy with work to use those tools. I cannot. Uh, they did not provide an answer or they said, I used other tools. 
that were developed by the regions or the municipalities that were more simplified tools. I think that's very insightful for us here. How do we make the tools simpler? The only times they were used were in complicated or urgent child protection incidents. So I think that's helpful. All right, next slide. Uh, so the, there were summary recommendations by those community social workers for, the, for uh, their work going forward. I think these are also helpful for us. Four recommendations. Uh, just click one. The first, to foster a closer partnership between the community authorities, the mayor's office, the regional municipality, and the government ministry. They found that would be critical for their work going forward. Click. Um, to just improve their working conditions. They're not asking for a lot here, but they say they just need a place to work, a phone, a means of transportation, a compensatory salary. But um, to provide the, the resources needed, not for themselves, but this is what we were re referring to earlier, so that when they go to a house that uh, and the family is in need, whether it's baby food or helping get them uh, into school, that they're able to supply them with the needed resources, right? Or the referral uh, to the psychologist, whatever it may be. Uh, the, the social worker wants to have the toolkit available, right? Uh, that makes total sense. And finally, the, the community social workers uh, requested having repeated refresher trainings, including exchange experience, on-the-job training, and supportive supervision. Um, and that is all. And I really want to thank the CLASS project and those community social workers and, and all they have done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for sharing with us that uh, good practice from Armenia. So we have so far had two good practices as examples of uh, what um, organizations uh, together with the governments did in two operations. One focusing on the transit centers or accommodation locations, which is uh, the situation also that we have here in Romania. And the second one focusing on community engagement for child protection. So this brings us to the third good practice, and I would like to introduce to you Ms. Sabiha Kaptanovic. So Sabiha is a child protection program coordinator for emergency response in Bosnia and Herzegovina for Save the Children International. She has been working in this operation for a couple of years now, starting from 2017. Her work focuses on coordinating emergency responses, program development, uh, adapting various child protection tools through community building methods and capacity building. She's going to share with us a good practice from her work in this operation. Over to you, Sabiha. Thank you, Selena. Uh, I'm just taking my laptop with me, just in case. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Good to see you. I uh, hope you stretched enough and I don't need to uh, call you again to stand up uh, for the next round of stretching. Uh, I know it's been a long day, but uh, I'll try to keep it short and make it interesting and useful to you. Uh, so firstly, I am deployed here uh, as Save Children Romania, uh, where I'm also trying to pass some good practices from Bosnia and Herzegovina to Romania. Uh, what I'm gonna, can I get my presentation on, please? First, I would like to give uh, some context to you for those who are not aware of a uh, refugee and migrant Balkan crisis that has been going on uh, since 2015. Um, can I get the next slide with the map, please? 
So if you look at the map, uh, you will see a Balkan area and you will see that migration since 2015 have been going all around the Balkans. Uh, people move were mainly coming from Turkey and Greece, traveling uh, through Bulgaria, through North Macedonia, uh, Serbia, as well as Romania was affected. You will know better that than I do. Um, however, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina was not the, uh, the key uh, country uh, until 2018, because all the migrations were going through Serbia towards Hungary. However, from the moment when Hungary closed, closed its borders and uh, when a high level of violations was uh, reported, Bosnia and Herzegovina becomes the next key transit country. So since 2018 up to today, uh, all the main uh, migrations are going through this country. Um, can I get the next slide? And um, say the children position itself in a way that we are present in our eastern border with Serbia, uh, where, main, where is the main entrance to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Then we are like down towards south, where Sarajevo is, capital city of country, uh, where people are entering through Montenegro. And then uh, where the response was the heaviest and the most difficult to deal with, uh, where many violations and child protection uh, issues, concerns were uh, reported as on the northwest of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which bring us to um, border with Croatia. So border with Croatia became a next uh, spot where people were trying to cross and reach the countries of the EU. However, that was not uh, easy at all. And uh, we had great inflow of uh, people on the move, including families, families with children, families uh, with infants, and as well unaccompanied and separated children, uh, on whom I'm going to focus now. So uh, keeping in mind that there was a high number of unaccompanied and separated children traveling through Bosnia and Herzegovina who were without documents, who were not aware of any kind of rights and obligations that they may enjoy, uh, we saw the need and space to work on it together along with the government. Uh, before I go through details which steps we took, I would ask if we couldn't, if he could play the video, just to help you to picture a situation through which uh, people on the move were uh, going through while they were in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are getting there. We don't have sound, or we will have sound. Okay. So we wait for a second. I give you some rest. <laughs> For most of these people, they really have no choice. There is no place to go. We start from Bihać, we go to Velika Kladusha, and on the way we see if there is refugees, and there are. I mean, today is extraordinary with the snow. Usually we already, by now, we saw at least 10, 15, 20 Indians a day. This place used to have hundreds of people. Now, because of the tough climate, only around 10 people left here. So half of them are kids. Yeah. <laughs> 
Since they are four or five underage, we try to accommodate them in the cab, but we have to see how many places there is in the cab. <coughs> and if the cab will accept them, we have to contact the legal guardian, and we will see. If everything is okay, maybe we can accommodate four or five of them. How are you on a car? I mean, the place is terrible by itself, from burning plastic to completely collapsing building. It's just a disaster. It's a terrible place. So now, outside, there will be the social worker. Hopefully, if some of them have documentation that they are underage, they will be facilitated in the camp. It's like an extraordinary situation. I cannot enter the camp, I can't go back to my country, and I can't access to Croatia. What shall I do? There is nothing. <laughs> Believe me, all these kids, they deserve to get a chance, to get the help they, they need. I hope everyone, not just kids, can get a proper place and a good place to be. I mean, you're tired, but it feels good. It feels like you did something, so... Go. So it is a big achievement, actually it is, but sometimes we wish that we can do better. Thank you. Thank you for watching it. I hope it gives a bit clearer picture uh, on what I'm going to talk about here now. So when we talk about people who are about children in the move, and specifically unaccompanied and separated children in the move in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, who are without accommodation, who are in outreach locations, we don't talk about private accommodations, we don't talk about hotels or, or houses, we talk usually about squats empty building, abandoned building without any facilities. So for us to do our job, uh, we came to an agreement with Service for Foreign Affairs and Centers for Social War, uh, Welfare that for uh, children to be accommodated, they, uh, for children to gain any kind of right, actually, they have to first be accommodated in the centers. Uh, but the, the main problem for us was that there were no uh, adequate accommodations for unaccompanied and separated children within Bosnia and Herzegovina. So the only thing uh, government at that uh, point could uh, think of, can you please just go back to presentation, yes. Uh, you can go next slide. The next one. Yes, we can stay there. So the only thing uh, we, the government at that moment could think of is accommodating those children within single man camps. Um, by itself, that is already a huge child protection risk and problem, but since we did not have any other choice, we came in agreement that then there will be a designated zones for unaccompanied and separated children, and say the children will provide 24-7 protection within the, those zones. So from that, that moment on, we started uh, spending our time in those single man camps 24-7, uh, we managed to provide uh, protection by presence, we managed to provide medical protection where we were the one taking children to doctors, providing and following on their therapy that they had to take, and of course having structured set of psychosocial, recreative, educational activities, and especially giving um, a lot of space to child participation. Because at one point we had over 400 unaccompanied uh, and separated children within one space. And having teenagers of different ages and different nationalities and cultures can be challenging. Um, therefore, we came to an idea, let's uh, create a platform which we will call Boys Parliament. And on a weekly basis, we will meet up with these boys and we will talk about issues they are facing with and we will try to find solutions together. And I have to say that that is one of the great positive practices we had because it proved to work and it proved to be very uh, useful. 
Next slide, please. The next thing, uh, since our social welfare was overwhelmed and um, had an issue with uh, specifically with recruitment and with the staffing, uh, we again came to an agreement with our centers for social welfare that say that children uh, employees will be assigned as legal guardians to specifically those unaccompanied and separated children. And at that mo moment, we had our legal guardians present in the at the field, interacting with the children and uh, making sure that their best interests and rights are preserved and guaranteed. The next thing we did, uh, kind of that gives a final to this uh, story is introducing case management uh, by implementing all six steps that case management has upon, again, request of uh, services for uh, social welfare. Um, since we had very high number of children and we had many uh, child protection issues and different kind of child protection abuses that we were, that those children were facing with, we thought that case management will be a great response to it because then we will get to deal with each child per person individually by creating individual plans together with Center for Social Welfare, together with other relevant institutions and uh, organizations. So with uh, case management, we managed to provide quality, consistency, and coordination of services. We managed to um, uh, respond to particular vulnerabilities or risks and have a broader range of welfare and social protection concerns. One of the cases I can sh uh, share with you regarding the successful case management is that unfortunately uh, we had two confirmed cases of sexual abuse. Uh, it uh, went to persecution and at that moment persecution was uh, asking and requesting from us uh, all the detailed documentation information we gathered. Uh, and we were able to respond and to deliver um, those documents thanks to case management we established. And then thanks to those documentation we provided to persecution, they were able to charge the person uh, who violated the boys guilty. Um, so these are like, please next slide. Uh, these and next one. Thank you, and you know, we can go to the next one. And these are kind of uh, things that uh, give us complete picture of the child protection system we uh, developed in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we start with the presence of 24-7, we uh, invite legal guardians, and we create case management. Something that I don't want to for uh, forget is that during COVID-19, teams were still present 24-7 in the camps, in the areas that were uh, where general population was living, but as well in areas where we had infected uh, children in the move, we were there and providing our services. Next. This will quickly bring me to Romania, uh, because Save the Children in Romania is doing a great amount of job as well, and at the map you can see that uh, we are present all across the country. Uh, at different border crossings, at different asylum centers, refugee camps, and if we're going to speak about uh, unaccompanied and separated children in Romania and what Save the Children does, at the moment Save the Children is uh, present in Center Bucium, uh, which offers accommodation for 43 institu institutionalized Ukrainian children and their nine givers, caregivers with uh, nine children of caregivers. At the moment we are providing everyday activities to them and they will be also um, involved in education uh, system soon. Um, we can go to the next slide with the name uh, Lessons Learned, please. This brings me to uh, Lessons Learned. So what did we learn in Bosnia and Herzegovina from our response and what maybe you could learn from us is that first and first, uh, good collaboration and communication and working side by side with governmental institution is crucial. Uh, assist them and support them the best way we can uh, do that. Second one uh, important lesson that we kind of unfortunately learned in a difficult way is we really need to provide adequate uh, accommodation for unaccompanied and separated children. Um, solutions we had were far from ideal. We tried to deal with them the best way we could. Uh, but definitely it's something that we should uh, still fight for and uh, provide a proper accommodation for, for these children. 
And the third um, lesson that I would kind of point out is when we are doing rapid risk assessments, uh, we should do it as possible, as detailed, and we should not only think about child safeguarding or child protection, safety and security, but we should also keep mind on uh, communications and advocacy. Can you please go uh, to the next and the next and the next? Because all these practices that we, uh, that one, yes. Uh, and then you actually can go to the next one, so I don't keep you um, bothering and I don't cut myself anymore. Uh, so all these uh, positive practices that we were learning and trying to uh, bring to the life, uh, we have our colleagues in Belgrade where they are, they are sitting in a hub called Balkans Migration Displace Displacement Hub. And what they do, they take our practices from the field and put them on the paper. So uh, if you go and visit their site, uh, you may find uh, different kind of tools because, uh, yeah, that could be useful for you. And then I would like to finish my presentation with a message from the boy that says that life is a journey. We do not know where it might take us and what kind of struggles we might, we might face. We need to learn new skills and prepare ourselves for experiences that might seem rough. Multimask. Mulțumim foarte mult tuturor celor care au prezentat exemplele de bune practici din alte state. Nu știu dacă ordinea prezentărilor a fost întâmplătoare, însă dacă a fost, merg pe principiu că nimic nu e întâmplător în viață, pentru că noi am avut practic ocazia să vedem un tablou complet al unei, astfel, al unei intervenții într-o astfel de situație, pornind de la momentul zero în care trebuie să oferi soluții pentru o situație de urgență, trecând prin partea de colaborare dintre instituții și terminând cu colaborarea dintre sectorul public și sectorul privat. Exemplul prezentat din Germania ne-a arătat ce înseamnă o mobilizare pentru oferirea unei soluții de protecție a persoanelor aflate în astfel de situații în momentul zero, primirea pe teritoriul altui stat, însă ne-a arătat că orice astfel de soluție tinde să se transforme în măsuri care să vizeze protecția persoanelor respective pe termen mediu și lung. Prin urmare, este nevoie de instrumente comune de lucru care să fie adaptate însă nevoilor celor care sunt beneficiari direcți. Trecând mai departe la exemplul din Armenia, am văzut cât este de importantă colaborarea dintre autorități și cred că aici avem încă timp să ne pregătim ca orice set de măsuri sau orice instrumente de natură metodologică am oferit celor care lucrează practic la firul ierbii, ele trebuie să vină la pachet și cu resursele necesare. Pentru că supraaglomerarea resursei umane existente în condiții de funcționare normale ale unui sistem poate duce la scăderea calității serviciilor pe care le oferă aceiași oameni unei categorii noi de beneficiari cu care poate nu s-au confruntat până în acel moment. Și nu în ultimul rând, colaborarea dintre sectorul public și cel privat. Ea trebuie să fie încurajată și să continue pentru că, într-adevăr, flexibilitatea de care dă dovadă sectorul neguvernamental poate veni să suplinească eforturile sau măsurile pe care statul, administrația, din vari motive, în anumite constrângeri, le poate oferi și atunci acest parteneriat nu poate fi decât în beneficiul celor direct vizați. Cred că firul roșu al tuturor acestor prezentări este faptul că nicio măsură pe care o vom lua nu trebuie să fie luată fără consultarea celor direct implicați. Așa cum au subliniat toți colegii mei care au avut prezentări, consultarea beneficiarilor, consultarea copiilor în cazul nostru sau al persoanelor refugiate este fundamentală pentru ca eficiența măsurilor pe care le gândim să corespundă exact nevoilor lor. Cred că multe, din din, multe aspecte din exemplele prezentate în unele ne-am regăsit deja, în altele avem timp să reflectăm și să luăm măsuri astfel încât să evităm greutățile sau dificultățile întâmpinate de alte state, dar cred că suntem totuși pe drumul cel bun. Mulțumesc foarte mult tuturor celor care ați avut răbdare și să rămâneți până în acest moment. Sper că lecțiile, modelele prezentate... Ne, ne dau de gândit și ne arată ce avem de făcut pe mai departe și cred că putem închide aici sesiunea care a fost într-adevăr extrem de lungă. Mulțumesc! Are cineva microfonul? Mulțumesc mult! Um...
Mulțumesc și eu pentru intervenții, pentru prezentări. Așa cum vă promiteam mai devreme, intrăm acum în ultima pauză a reuniunii noastre, în care o să invit pe colegii mei din echipa de organizare de la cabinetul meu, de la guvern, dar și de la Plan International, să sprijine participanții în procesul de primire a certificatelor de participare. Acesta este un aspect. După aceea mai bem o cafea și un suc și ne reîntoarcem în 10-15, în 15 minute în sală cu rugămintea să nu plecați după ce, după ce vă luați diplomele și după aceea să, să tragem concluziile acestei întâlniri și să vedem ce facem mai departe, cum continuăm, pentru că nu ne dorim ca acesta să fie doar un eveniment izolat care se închide aici, ci am planificat o serie de lucruri despre care vrem să vă spunem și de asemenea să vă spunem și unde mai puteți găsi resursele despre care noi am povestit până acum. De asemenea, la final, dacă veți, veți avea întrebări punctuale față de ceea ce s-a discutat până acum, le așteptăm cu drag și sunt sigură că specialiștii noștri și experții atât de la noi din țară cât și din, din afară vor, vor fi gata să vă răspundă. Vă mulțumesc, ne vedem afară!